Symphonic Tales presents an original audio drama, Journey of a Dead Man, starring Emma Jade Meeshan as Meevy, Thomas G. Burt as Shane Lambert, Amy Heather Jackson as Sophia Valdez, Stephen Walker as Michael Woods, Chris Kay as Alex Shepard and Jack Summers, Sophia as Lenides as Rachel Tanner, Andrew Rolfe as Max Howard, Zoe Cunningham as Tracy, Bridget Hemingway as the Prime Minister, Josh Timmins as the Police Officer, Aidy Dimberline as Dr. Spencer, Megan Green as the Nurse, Alexander James Gilbert as Jason Summers, Ian Skinner as the Radio Broadcaster, Simon Hooson as Robert Peverell, and Crispin Holland as the Narrator. Written and directed by Alexander James Gilbert. Welcome back to Mars Initiative Audio Logs. Password to Orion Industries has been accepted. Opening Audio Log 12. Dated 21st December 2025. That red ball's getting a lot bigger. Only two more days until we set foot on her. What do you think we'll find down there? Lots of barren, untouched land. Water, hopefully. Won't know until we get down there. That's the fun of it, Lambert. The explorers. The reward is in the discovery. Have you two got for your secret Santa? I've got Shepard. And all I can find is a matching pair of socks. Sawyer. Tanner. Trade you for Shepard. No chance. No chance of what? Um. Woodsy is trying to pawn off his secret Santa. Right. Well, we've got more important things we need to be doing. It's only a bit of fun, Captain. All right. For now, though, I want you to run another simulation for landing. Tanner, now you're getting along with those data dumps. It's roughly halfway there. Mimi has uploaded about 50% of the communication software patch from her core to the lander's interface and the hub module data drive. Just sifting through the last bits of code now. Great work. Okay, Valdez, I want you and Lambert to inspect the gear. Make sure you have everything ready for final checks. Will do, boss. Incoming transmission. Captain, receiving an update from Earth. Okay, go ahead. How are you all doing out there? We're all getting very excited back here. In two days, you'll be proving right what Washington thought would be the impossible. <laughs> I just got an update for you all here. Uh, we've detected an object on course for Mars. We suspect it's an asteroid. Hubble is looking into it and will clarify shortly. Uh, it'll be passing by Mars on Sol 50. It'll look like a shooting star. Something else for you to enjoy on your trip. Audio log terminated. The Journey of a Dead Man, Episode 2. A night to remember. Three minutes, Prime Minister. Thank you, Tracy. Is this the final draft? Yes, ma'am. With the amendments you asked for. Thank you. And be sure to give Marcus my thanks also. I will, ma'am. How did it come to this? It all feels so surreal, like living out a movie. I know this message isn't going to be taken well. You'll do fine, Mum. You have a good team behind you. You have all the science and medical advice to support this decision. It's for the good of the country. Thank you. Be sure to remind me who to come to in future for counsel. (laughs) Thank you, Mum. 30 seconds. You'll do fine, Mum. We're live in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Good evening. The MV-108 virus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades, and we are not alone.
Morning, officer. Good morning, sir. The reason why I've pulled you over is due to the lockdown and the restriction of non-essential travel for non-key workers. Can you tell me the reason for your journey today? Ah, yes. Dr. Jack Summers. Thank you, Mr. Summers. You can go on your way. Won't be like this all the time, will it? I mean, being pulled over every time I travel to work. Unfortunately, Mr. Summers, some people are abusing the lockdown rules and we're having to take action. Though, as you're a key worker, the same rules don't apply. If you do get stopped again, just show the officer your ID card. I hope you understand. We're just doing our job. Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Summers. Stay safe. And you're doing a great job. Jack stands in front of a vending machine in a trance-like state. To any outsider, he appears deep in thought, though none would guess exactly where his mind is wandering. It has been two weeks since the Susie Jackson news report, but all Jack can think about are those piercing green eyes. There was something unnatural about them. The sounds of patients passing by and the distant harmonics of ECGs brings him back to reality. It has been a busy day so far. Two essential surgeries, five CT scans and an MRI. The hospital is indeed alive with activity, more so than is normal thanks to the spike in MV108 cases. One half of the hospital has been quickly retrofitted into quarantine zones to treat patients with the virus. And nearly all the intensive care units have been set aside to deal with the expected increase in cases. Though Jack has yet to come into contact with an infected patient, his daily work life is notably affected by the virus. I can see this lockdown lasting more than three weeks. You see videos of these stupid idiots sunbathing in parks, attacking police officers. Sally was spat at on the way to work the other day. Yeah, you're right. And I guarantee it'll be the people breaking the rules who will be the first to complain. Have you heard from Lawrence at all? I hear the front line's getting worse every day. Not yet. Poor guy. <laughs> the front line. God, sounds like we're in a war. Well, I suppose we are. And the enemy is invisible. Okay, Churchill, calm down. Last I heard from him, they'd lost eight people in ICU. Seven with underlying health conditions, and one who was completely healthy. Let's just hope this virus doesn't adapt or mutate. We're struggling to find a cure as it is. Dr. Summers, you're needed in Ward 3. Jack arrives to find his patient has suffered a loss in their muscular functions, followed by a temperature peaking at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. He can't hide the look of shock on his face. Only hours earlier, this patient had been recovering well from a simple tonsillectomy. Now drained of colour and barely conscious, he looks completely different. Jack realises with a look of horror that he is now on the front line. This man is infected. Doctor, patients had a post-tonsillectomy bleed. HB was 120G over L put him on a blood transfusion, then moved him back into surgery for investigation and cauterization. The bloods are now at 140 G over L. He's on a course of tranexamic acid and homoxiclav. I went to take his blood pressure and I noticed it was elevated, uh, along with a high temperature and fever. The antibiotics don't seem to be taking effect. The infection is also affecting his respiratory system. Well, apart from the recovery, all signs are pointing to MV108. Get some protective gear. We're taking him to ICU as quickly as we can. Make a call to the ward, tell him to get a bed ready. Luke, can you hear me? There is no response. Jack reaches towards Luke's eyes to check on his pupils. He opens them, then takes an immediate step back. The eyes are green. 
a bright, unnatural, piercing green, just like the feral man in the news broadcast. Nurse, get some access and give him an IV bolus, five mils per kilo. Then give him some high-flow mask oxygen and prepare for intubation. The same thing's just happened on wards six and nine. A Spencer's patient has gone mad, yelling, screaming, trying to crawl their way out of bed. If anything, it might be a good idea to restrain this man for his own safety. Yes, you're right. With Luke restrained, Jack notices his temperature increase by another 10 degrees. The beeping of the ECG quickens as the man's heart rate increases. His skin has paled to a sickly grey and his body is drenched in sweat. Luke begins to violently convulse and his hands claw at the bedsheets. His green eyes dart backwards and forwards. Jack is momentarily transfixed as he locks eyes with the man. There is nothing left of Luke in those eyes. No life, no soul, just anger and fear. Jack Doctor. is brought back to reality by a continuous tone Can coming from the ECG. Luke has flatlined. Jack begins CPR and attempts to resuscitate him. It fails. Doctor? 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 Yes, what? You've got to call it. Ah, uh, time of death. 1830. <sighs> he has never lost a patient under his care, and the guilt is weighing heavily on his shoulders. Luke has died alone, and he will remain alone. No family as he passed. No funeral service. No wake for his loved ones to mourn. <sighs> oh, what the hell? Phone. What time is it? What? Oh, I left it on silent again. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Ah, oh, finally. Jason, what the... What are you doing here? It's the middle of the night. No time. Pack your things and get dressed. We're leaving. Pack my things? Jason, it's half past one. Well, let's wait until morning. I'm not fucking around here. Just do as I say, all right? You gonna tell me what this is all about or what? What the hell was that? It started. What? What started? Come on, uh, help me with this load, will you? You tell me what the fuck is going on first. I got a call four hours ago saying that the reserves were being deployed to secure the city. Me being me, I wanted to know why. So I called an old buddy of mine who works at Whitehall. He tells me the Prime Minister has been evacuated and the spread of the virus has gone out of control. He heard from a friend at the CDC there's more to this virus than we're being told. Said something about a Robert Peveril. Got cut off after that. Right, so we're leaving because of some crazy conspiracy theory? Just get in the damn car. Okay. Right. Nice cricket bat, by the way. This is an emergency announcement. Full government lockdown is in effect. Violent rioting has broken out in city centres. Residents are to remain indoors. If you are caught breaking lockdown, you will be arrested. Please stay indoors. Please stay safe. The car comes to a sudden halt. An abandoned hatchback is left in the middle of the road ahead all the doors wide open and headlights shining brightly. A figure is crouched by the passenger door wearing what seems to be a hospital gown. Just go around them. No. No, something's not right. The driver of the car is sprawled out on the floor. 
The crouched figure is on top of him. There is a pool of blood around them. The figure suddenly turns to face Jason and Jack's car. Its skin is as pale as the moonlight. Black veins protrude from the flesh, appearing to flow with a thick, dark substance. Its fingernails are a misty grey and coated in blood. The face is a dark shadow, only the bright green eyes distinguishable from the mass of pulsing veins. Shit, Jason, move! The figure hits the car with great force before disappearing from view. Jack exits and slowly skirts around the car until he can see the figure. The body lies still on the floor, silent. Black liquid oozes from its head. Jack bends down to take a closer look at the face. Its eyelids snap open to reveal those green eyes, and it snaps its jaw at Jack. Jack falls onto his back, hitting his head hard on the tarmac. The figure crouches on top of him, its eyes dripping with black pus that begins to drench Jack's shirt. Jack pushes his hand up against the figure's shoulders, using all his strength to try to force it off him, to no avail. Just kill it! Kill it, Jack! Kill it! The weight of the figure comes crashing down on Jack's chest, robbing him of his strength. Just as the figure goes in for the kill, a cricket bat collides with its head. What? That should have killed it. As he lifts for a final swing, the figure suddenly collapses, as if someone had turned off the lights. Jason waits in anticipation of another attack, but it doesn't come. The figure is dead. You all right? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm okay. You can't hesitate to kill these things, Jack. You hesitate and you die, okay? That's murder. Jason, it's unethical. They're not people anymore, Jack. Put your Hippocratic Oath aside for one second and see reality. They're gone. Dead. If you want proof, just turn him over and see for yourself. Jack rolls the body over to reveal a battered face. He looks the corpse over and stops at its wrist. A patient identification wristband. No, I can't be. St. Thomas's Hospital the hospital where Jack works. The patient was Luke Forrester, the same patient who had died under Jack's care hours earlier. Come on, mate. More will be on the way soon if we don't get out of here. Yeah, you're right. Let's go. As they leave the city behind, the flames of what had once been society burn brightly into the night. Jack can only think about how and why this is happening. But the how and why no longer matter. The outbreak is here, and there's nothing that can be done to change it. All they can do is move on and survive. We strive to be better. Technologically and... Scientifically. Man has come a long way since the invention of the wheel. From the first steps on the moon to the discovery of the Higgs boson and the colonization of other worlds. The strive to improve society, to better the potential of the human race is a long sought after goal. Yet what happens when we close our eyes and remember the things that are not in our control? When we take a step back and realize technology and science can never overcome nature. When a single virus has spread and begins to mutate into something new and our technology is useless to stop it. What do we do then? The only thing we can do, what humanity does best, survive. Survive 
by any means.